Hello, I'm John Molusky. Welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And this is a very special edition of Now. It's being conducted in partnership with the Wilson Center's Asia program. And it's happening on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of independence for India and Pakistan and the end of colonial rule. And you're going to be hearing a lot about that in just a moment from two terrific guests. We we're really lucky to have uh, a, a perfect panel for this discussion. Joining us is Nuram Pama Rao, who is a Wilson Center Global Fellow and an advisory board member for the Center's Asia program. She previously served as India's secretary, uh, foreign secretary, and as India's ambassador to both the United States and to China. Also with us, Akbar Ahmed, also a Wilson Center Global Fellow, who previously served as Pakistan's High Commissioner to the UK and Ireland. And Akbar is currently a professor at American University School of International Service, where he also serves as the Ibn Khaldun Chair of Islamic Studies. And speaking of the Asia program, it's program's uh, Deputy Director and Senior Associate for South Asia. Michael Kugelman is also with us today. So I want to give a, a hearty welcome to all three of you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, John. Thank you. So, uh, Michael, I thought what we could begin with is having you do a little scene setting for us. You know, I, I gave a very cursory overview of what we're going to be talking about. If you could provide our viewers with a little more insight into uh, what we'll be discussing over the next 40 to 50 minutes. Absolutely. So thank you, John, and, and thank you to, uh, to Akbar and Nora Palma for, for joining us for, uh, for this very timely discussion. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's quite common around this time of year uh, for many of us to reflect on the state of the India-Pakistan relationship as each country marks its independence anniversary. Uh, but you know, the 75-year anniversary is an especially important one to highlight, and not just because the number 75 tends to get a lot of attention in commemorations of any type. Uh, India and Pakistan marked their 75th anniversaries at a particularly tough moment for the relationship. It's been quite a while, for example, since there was any type of comprehensive formal dialogue in place. Just a few, just a few years ago, India and Pakistan came very close to going to war uh, for what it be, would have been the first time in quite some, quite some years. Geopolitics, current geopolitics don't favor the relationship either. India has scaled up defense cooperation with the U.S. in recent years, leading to major inflows of U.S. weapons and defense technology into India, which makes Pakistan weary about um, uh, the need for what it describes as strategic stability in South Asia. Meanwhile, Pakistan has deepened its ties with China, which troubles India, which views China as its biggest strategic and long-term rival. And finally, the power of social media really serves as a toxic multiplier of hateful words from, from hardliners on both sides. But all that said, at the same time, maybe, and, all, and I'll put my optimist hat on here, maybe all these troubling signs suggest that the India-Pakistan relationship is due for a better period. And I think it's important to note that the India-Pakistan relationship is not a story of constant hostility. It has had some really bad real bad times, but also some not so bad times. And it's had a few relatively good times. And you now for those of you that uh, may be fans of the band uh, Led Zeppelin, this is a relationship that's had its share of good times, bad times, even though more bad times than good times. Um, so that, gives, that, that suggests that we, we, there could be potential for, for some improvements. Um, and I would just note that if you look back at the history of the relationship, um, there have been some times when, for example, trade ties have been quite good between the two. Over their first 18 years post-independence, there were 14 bilateral agreements related to trade facilitation. That's just one example. Coming back to the closer to the present, um, you know, there's been a, a cooperation in some non-security spaces um, from dialogues over water sharing tied to the Indus Waters Agreement between the two to the assistance the two have provided to each other when one suffered a natural disaster. And most recently, there was a new border truce concluded between India and Pakistan last year, which helped bring down tensions uh, just a bit. But all that said, and I'll send things back to you here, John, you know, there are some fundamental constraints to the relationship that are really tough to overcome, even with some, even if we want to try to be optimistic. Um, you know, the impact of partition, for example, is one of them. We can go into that history a bit if you'd like. Also, the issue of Kashmir, uh, which is, a, you know, which is, a, of course, a disputed region that both sides have claimed in its, entire, in its entirety, uh, though in reality, both countries um, administer parts of it. That's been tough to overcome. The issue of terrorism is big as well, and that India um, uh, views Pakistan as a country that has uh, harbored and, um, and assisted terrorists that have carried out attacks in India. 
Um, so a lot to unpack, um, but with that, I'll send things back to you, John. Th thanks, Michael. And, and you mentioned a lot to unpack. And what, what your overview really describes is the complexity of the relationship and the, the situation that we're talking about. And I thought, you know, on this uh, commemoration at 75 years, I should tell our viewers and listeners, we were chatting a bit before we began this discussion with you. And uh, we were noting that in the U.S. press, you barely see any coverage of this. Now, if you look in the UK press or in the press in India and Pakistan, certainly that's a different story. But I wonder, uh, Akbar and Nirampama, if you could give us some insight into how this anniversary is observed in the countries we're talking about. I mean, you know, there's a celebratory aspect of independence, but then we're also talking about a period where millions were killed and tens of millions displaced. So it, it's certainly not, you know, uh, just uh, fireworks and celebrations. Niram Pama, could we begin with you? H how is this anniversary observed in India? Uh, thank you. Thank you, John and Michael. I'm very happy to be here uh, to share this platform with Akba. Uh, as far as the commemoration, the celebration of the 75th anniversary of India's independence is concerned, uh, it's quite a huge affair. And uh, there are a series of events planned through the year, in fact, uh, to commemorate and celebrate uh, this occasion. Uh, and the focus is essentially on all the progress we've made since independence. Uh, very little reference to the partition uh, or, you know, all the suffering that accompanied it. So we call it Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, which is, you know, the, the beautiful festival, the, a kind of a festival of spring and of reawakening to celebrate independence. So in that reawakening, we are not really focused on the history history of, uh, of what happened at the time of independence, because independence really resulted in the partition of India into two countries, India and Pakistan. And uh, if you are talking about, um, you know, how we view Pakistan or how the media in the country views Pakistan, I think, as uh, was said recently, we built a kind of romance around division, really, a romance around division. And we remain fixated on the difference that exists between India and Pakistan, not so much on the history that we share, not so much on all that united us before partition happened. And, you know, the rich civilizational heritage that is common, in fact, to all the countries in South Asia. So the dilemma, I believe, before us is how to create a sense of wholeness about this history and about our common heritage and about our futures also as uh, citizens and uh, residents of a region with, which is essentially meant to be an integer but is not an integer today. We lack integration. We don't speak about regionalism. I think uh, SARC, the South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation is the Cinderella in this story. Thank you. Uh, Akbar, I'm gonna ask you the similar question from the Pakistani perspective. How is this 75th anniversary observed? Uh, John, to most Pakistanis, if not all, the very creation of Pakistan and its sustaining to be able to live and breathe has been a miracle. So Pakistanis really celebrate these anniversaries like a, it's like Pakistan is like a special gift, as it were, from, from the divine. And uh, I've seen increasingly the more Pakistan is under pressure, the greater the problems, the greater this sense of patriotism, particularly in the young generation. In the older generation, there's some cynicism, there's constant complaints about the political failures, the economic failures. But in the young, the younger generation, and there's a whole new generation. Pakistan is a very, very much a young uh, population, has a young population. So in this young generation, there's great fervor, there's great uh, enthusiasm for Pakistan, for the notion of Pakistan, and a will to make Pakistan what Pakistanis have always wanted, to be a viable and even a great nation in, in Asia. And so in that sense, the 75th is a very special anniversary because Pakistan is acutely aware that in 1971, it broke up, so that it lost half its uh, population, more than half its population, but yet survived. So it's a sense of we are going to survive in spite of all the, all the pressures, and that is where this, uh, this element of the divine comes in. And this is what I think really drives uh, many Pakistanis. 
Now, I must emphasize that uh, I am certainly, and I'm sure Ambassador Rao, we are here in our private capacities. We are not representing any government in South Asia or any political party. And that's important to say because we can then step back and look at this um, 75th anniversary in a more philosophic, in a more humanistic way than we would if we were talking in terms of the, the normal bureaucrats, bureaucrats uh, talking to each other. Because Michael rightly pointed out in his uh, excellent overview, uh, very often when Indians and Pakistanis meet, then the Indians will talk about terrorism in Pakistan, Pakistan will talk about uh, the genocide and the uh, fascism and so on on the other side of the border, and talks immediately break down. I think it's really important on such an occasion, the 75th, to step back and say, this is where we've got to, how have we got to where we are now, and where do we want to go? What is the next 50, 75 years? I think it's very important that the scholars and intellectuals on both sides, because this cannot be a clap with one hand, it has to be with both hands, that the scholars and intellectuals on both sides really begin to ask these big questions, big philosoph philosophic questions. Where are we heading? Where will we be in the next 50 to 75 years? And how are we to live together? This is a land, uh, John, which is um, amazing. Uh, Ambassador Rao pointed out this legacy that we have, these great notions of peace, shanti, uh, seva, uh, ahimsa. These are great Hindu concepts from the Sanskritic tradition. In Islam, there's sule kul, that is peace with all. This is the inherited legacy of all of South Asia, India and Pakistan. And somehow we have either diluted it or distorted it. So we are reduced to this very brittle relationship between these two countries. Sometimes, but sometimes also a lot of warmth and friendship. You'll see that constantly across the border. Uh, I'll share this and then I'll uh, pass it on to Ambassador Rao. One of the best reviews I've ever got, John, you know my books and you're familiar with launching some of them. One of the best reviews ever was given to me by a very distinguished Indian scholar. He was a judge, Krishna Ayer from South India. And he reviewed my book, Postmodernism and Islam, in the Economic and Political Weekly from Bombay. Very uh, established, respected the journal. And this is how he began the review. He said, this is the title. This is the author. I'm in love with both. Not in Pakistan or anywhere in the world. So there's also this aspect uh, in this India-Pakistan relationship. Uh, there's a lot of uh, um, um, fireworks and uh, anger and hatred, and you'll see this happening. You just Google the media across the border in India, for example, and you see a lot of uh, very, very, uh, really shockingly hateful stuff coming out. One uh, program which uh, which was broadcast uh, two weeks ago actually had this title: "Is it time to finish off Pakistan?" And then on the other hand, you have the example of these extraordinarily uh, humanist. Uh, guru-like figures like uh, Krishna here. So we have to remember it's very complex. It has a history going back a thousand years. And I am hopeful that we'll, we'll find our balance for the future. And this younger generation may play that role. You, you know, all three of you have made comments that indicate that you're all forward thinkers and that, you know, you want to look ahead, not completely at the past. But before we do that, and I know I'm going to turn it over to Michael for some of his questions, which I know will take us in that direction. But before doing that, I'd like to ask each of, each of you to uh, share a little history lesson with us in, in, in a, on a personal level. Akbar, I know that you were a young boy during the time of partition and actually were one of those people who got on the train, one of the trains. Uh, but I don't. I know you were very young, so I don't know how misty and watercolored your memories may be. Uh, uh, Ambassador Rao, I know you weren't alive at the time, but I'm sure that your family has talked about it, and there's personal lore. So I'm going to ask each of you if you would share some uh, personal remembrances of your earliest memories of how this moment in history was talked about in your family and among your friends. And then, Michael, I'm going to turn it over to you, and then you can bring us uh, fast forward into the future or, or into the present, and then we can look ahead, as both guests have made clear that they'd like to do. Ambassador Rao, let's begin with you. 
Uh, well, John, I uh, am the daughter of an army officer. My father served in the Indian Army and he joined the army during World War II and had served in pre-partitioned India. He'd served in cities like Lahore and he would tell us stories when we were growing up of his time there in Raul Pindi and Lahore. So these were just place names for us on the map. And growing up as an army child, uh, of course, one went through, uh, one witnessed the trauma of... Uh, the war with China in 1962 and the war with Pakistan in 1965, and also the war that led to the liberation of Bangladesh in 1971, which was on the eve, really, two years before I joined the Foreign Service and took up a career in diplomacy. So one was witness definitely to all these uh, very seminal events in the relationship between two neighbors. And of course, the fact that the issue of Kashmir loomed large over the entire landscape of the India-Pakistan relationship, because that was where, you know, the, um, uh, the uh, people we knew, uh, the people we called our uncles, you know, in subcontinent, we call friends of our parents, uncles and aunties. So that's where our uncles went and fought. Some of them never came back. Um, and, uh, you know, one was uh, one had to ingest all of this growing up, but it wasn't so much a landscape, uh, you know, pockmarked by the hate that you see uh, today. I wouldn't say that the relationship between India and Pakistan was in the place it is today. And in fact, I uh, you must have seen this book written by the young scholar Pallavi Raghavan called Animosity at Bay, which was how India and Pakistan managed their relationship between 1947 and 1952, particularly. I was, of course, too young to witness that, but I have read the book. And you understand that despite all the animosity that led to the partition of the subcontinent, India and Pakistan as newly sovereign states attempted uh, very uh, consciously and seriously to manage that relationship in a way that would address some of these divisions and enable the strengthening of institutions within each country that would be able to deal with governance and statecraft. So it is a time of state formation in some ways, but in some others contain point, uh, contains pointers to how that relationship could be managed even, even today, albeit with all the new geopolitical factors that are inherent to the situation. Because now when you look at India-Pakistan relations and you look at the vocabulary of that relationship, it's very much driven by, I would say, the vocabulary of Cold War politics, the mm. brinkmanship of, of deterrence, of, uh, of confidence, the need for confidence building measures. So in a sense, we've adopted that vocabulary when in a, in, in a way, uh, we have to understand that peace building between the two countries, which is what we need, uh, should include the sense of loss and vulnerability that both countries have essentially internalized over the years about this history, this very, very difficult, fractious history of the relationship. So, um, you know, when you talk of relations between India and Pakistan, it's almost as if we are in a state of civil war, the kind of civil war that you had in America between the North and the South in some ways. And we haven't yet reached a conclusion. Of course, we are two different countries, but in so many ways joined at the hip and 1100 years of, of our common history, I mean, after the, uh, the Muslims came to the subcontinent, that, that is the history that both our countries have to really uh, come to terms with in some ways, grapple with and make a sense of. I think, it, I know that in India, we're still yet to come to terms with it. And in many ways, it defines uh, the trajectory of domestic politics also today, the whole Hindu Muslim question. Thanks. Uh, Akbar, I want to ask you, you know, I know it's difficult for Professor Ahmed or Ambassador Ahmed to look back and remember what it was like as a little four-year-old Akbar, but wh what do you remember? And and how did your family talk about it? And how did this history uh, get onto your uh, radar as a young person growing up? Well, John, the um, four-year-old boy uh, was very innocent. He grew up in an environment where, as Ambassador Rao points out, all the issues too young, she wasn't born then. But the world we lived in, because my father was uh, in the uh, civil service, the British civil service, so 
he had a very comfortable life, lots of uh, people working under him, for him, Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs. There, there was no discrimination at all. But yet something was happening because even as a child, when I got onto that train with my parents and we crossed into the killing fields of Punjab, we crossed through that towards Karachi. So from Delhi to Karachi took several days and the train would stop every two hours, three hours. And my father, who's a very peaceful man, would say, don't move, don't anyone make a noise. Because what was happening is the trains going through to Pakistan were being slaughtered so that all the passengers would be killed, men, women, children, mm -hmm. except the train driver. Because the idea was to get the train to arrive at their destination with everyone dead, to make a point. Similarly, trains going to Delhi were slaughtered and the same thing would happen. So Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, there was a kind of madness that had descended on all of, all of South Asia. And I think it was a very disgraceful period of, of history and we should all be ashamed of it. So I remembered very distinctly that sense of, of wonder, really. It wasn't fright so much as wonder what was happening. Why is this? Why do people want to kill me? I mean, who am I? And that forced an answer. Am I being killed because I happen to be something called a Muslim? I had no idea what that Muslim meant. So years later, when I joined a boarding school up in the hills of Abtaba, and um, a boarding school run by uh, Christian missionaries, and we again, there were Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, uh, Christians in that school. No one had any distinction between these different religions. We grew up in that atmosphere. But I remember distinctly, even then, there was a great feeling that we are under threat that India is a bigger nation, it's more hostile, it wants to finish us off. So there was always that defensiveness. And that created in me personally a very strong desire to reach out, to try to reach out to friends, to enemies, to indifferent people around me who are hostile, to understand why is there a problem, why is there so much hate, and what can we do to dissipate that, to remove it? And is that hate based in ignorance? Is it based in prejudice? Is it based in lack of knowledge? What can I do to help create a bridge between these uh, positions to, to close the gap. And that prompted me, John, really over my life to get involved in interfaith and begin to understand. And I, I, I feel very gratified that, for example, the Gandhi Center in Washington, DC, Ambassador Rao has been honored there with the Gandhi Peace Award. And I was very honored to be uh, the first recipient of that award. And I really told myself that here's the Gandhi Center in Washington where Pakistanis don't even visit John, and they're giving me, with my Pakistani background, the first ever Gandhi uh, Peace Award. And of course, I requested the director, uh, Srimati Kamala, a wonderful person, and now Srimati Karuna. I said, if you invite the Pakistan ambassador and the Indian ambassador at this occasion and let them speak, this will again be a platform, like you are giving us, the Wilson Center is giving us this opportunity. That itself may not change much, but it always acts as a small, drip, drip, drip contribution to the idea of dialogue and continues that dialogue. And that is what happened. And, uh, the Pakistani ambassador turned up. He was my class fellow from the hall. He came and uh, the Indian uh, embassy sent a very senior, distinguished diplomat. It was a wonderful, wonderful evening. So that incident, the train ride, has left a traumatic uh, impact on my life because even now, and I'm uh, 80 years old, I'm this is my 80th year, so... I have now children, I have grandchildren, so my concern not is about me or even my children so much as my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And to me, the, the next and the next generation of Indians and Pakistanis, Hindus and Sikhs and Muslims, I ask myself, where are they going to be living? What sort of world are they living in? If that hatred continues, if it doesn't completely dissipate, and why can't we remove it? Why can't we face it, remove it? And really, as in South Africa with the Mandela and Desmond Tutu say, Let's have a truth and reconciliation committee remove this so that we can move ahead clean as it were, if possible. I know it's difficult, but I'm speaking as an idealist who has lived through it and also experienced both the ugly and the beautiful part of South Asian nature and culture. Well, I, I want to thank both of you for, for sharing your memories. I think, you know, we, it's obviously it's important that we look ahead, but it's also uh, important that we look back. And this was fascinating to hear from both of you. And Michael, I know you have thoughts to share and also many questions as well. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, John. I also really appreciated hearing from uh, Ambassador Rao and, 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 and Dr. Akbar. Really, um, 
just very moving um, and also inspiring stories uh, on many levels uh, to hear that. So thank you to both of you. And in listening to you, I had many thoughts, um, but um, I had two thoughts that I would, I guess, group into what I would describe as two Ds, one being demography, the other being diplomacy. So one of you, I think it was you, Akbar, had talked about how young these countries are, uh, which is true. I mean, demographically, youth dominate in India and Pakistan, and they will for many years. Now you're looking at uh, a, two countries where the median age is going to be in the low 20s for quite some time, I think. Maybe getting into the, it's, it's, it's pretty significant. So it sort of poses the question to me, given, or the, I think of this question, given that um, these countries are, are young and, and youth are going to dominate for so long, gets me to thinking about what the future of the relationship could be looking at taking into consideration these newer generations. And I've been very fortunate over the years to meet with groups of, in, of young Indian and Pakistanis, um, obviously not in either country, typically in a third country, in which we talk about their hopes for, for the future. And what, all, what oftentimes stands out in these conversations I have is that on both sides, I'll hear people say that they don't see the other side as an enemy. We don't see India, Pakistanis say we don't see India as an enemy. Indians say we, we don't see Pakistanis as an enemy. So that gives some hope perhaps. And you know, I think that the conventional wisdom is that young people will tend to be more open-minded and progressive than their parents' generations. Maybe so, but you know, the flip side of this is that you know, these newer generations of Pakistanis and Indians have come of age in very polarized political and media environments where you know, hate can, can win votes and it sells. Uh, and where they're really, it's not really fashionable to talk about India, Pakistan, detente. And indeed, I have spoke to plenty of interlocutors, younger interlocutors in both countries that want nothing of this talk of, of, of rapprochement or detente. So I guess one question to, to both of you would be, what do you make of the youth phenomenon in both countries in terms of how that could impact the future of the relationship? And the second thought I had gets to the issue of diplomacy. I had said at the top that you have these these fundamental constraints, uh, the Kashmir issue, the issue of terrorism. And you know, my question is, how realistic is it to think that in due course that the relationship can somehow get around those issues and not let those issues hold the broader relationship hostage? In other words, could we, could we get to a point where those two issues need not be preconditions for a broader dialogue? I think today the answer is no, not at all. I don't think we're there. Um, but the question is, can, if, if we want to be optimistic, can we think about that possibility? And if so, what are some of the CBMs, confidence building measures, uh, that low hanging fruit, some er areas of cooperation to pursue that could make that more of a likely option where we could sort of get around and sort of move beyond those issues of, of Kashmir and terrorism? So that's the second question. So I'll, I'll end there and I would love to hear uh, both of you offer your thoughts on both of those questions. Should Literally. I go first? Please, please, yes. <laughs> Uh, well, when it comes to the question of uh, demography, uh, Michael, uh, it's true that we are both very young nations, but speaking for my own country, I think uh, public opinion, and the youth included, is very much conditioned by the, the, the constant partitioning, I would say, of views within the media itself on the issue of relations with Pakistan. So. Uh, as far as the general public is concerned, most of them are busy going about their lives. They want better tomorrows for their children. And, uh, and they uh, spend very little time uh, being preoccupied with questions of relations with Pakistan. But it's the, it's the uh, perhaps the speaking public, the speaking heads that you see on television that use social media that are uh, more from the emergent middle class and the upper middle class sections of the population that have opinions on this issue. And when it comes to opinions on this issue, I'm afraid that peace and reconciliation and dialogue across divides, uh, they are not very much uh, trending, as you would say, to use media language these days uh, within within India it's it's got a lot to do I believe with the experience over the last uh, couple of decades with Pakistan especially since the insurgency began in Kashmir uh, in the early 90s and leading up uh, to the Mumbai attacks of 26 November 2008 and I see that as a kind of a watershed in this whole perspective that we have built up about Pakistan and on the question of terrorism. It was just as 
because uh, you know Pakistan and especially the Pakistani um, what they fashionably call the deep state and and you know the government which we deal with when there are discussions or negotiations emphasizes the question of Kashmir terrorism has come to dominate the landscape of our uh, of our approach uh, towards Pakistan uh, essentially because of the experience that we've had uh, as in terms of lives of ordinary citizens, this is an issue that has affected life at ground level within the country. Whether it is it was the question of what happened in Punjab uh, during the uh, so-called Khalistan movement in the 1980s, leading up to the insurgency in Kashmir, and then it began to affect life in our cities and you know where ordinary people on trains and planes and and uh, you know ordinary citizenry. So that has very much embedded itself in the psychology of Indians when it comes to Pakistan, the question of terrorism. And uh, whether we'll be able to set that aside, that is essentially your question, and look at you know, the future of this relationship remains still a question that is not resolved. It is, uh, it is very much an issue within domestic politics today. It's not something that any government seeking election or going to the people in order to seek a mandate can afford to set aside because it, it has affected the lives of people. And we feel that with India's advances, India's growth, India's uh, you know, looking out uh, to, uh, to become a leading country in the world, do we really need to, to um, uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, invest valuable time and resources in seeking an entente with Pakistan when all our previous attempts to do so have run aground, have not been successful, and uh, we have not been able to get satisfactory answers from the Pakistani state. Uh, I'm not talking of the people, but from the Pakistani state about this whole question of dealing with insurgency and terrorist groups and extremists that have made Pakistan their home, unfortunately, and affected lives of Pakistanis also as a result. This has been a problem that has come home to roost in Pakistan also. But yeah. it's a it's a very, very troubled landscape. It's a very, uh, it's it seems hopeless in some ways. I hope that can, that will not be the situation when we speak about it a few years hence. It's important that we don't subscribe to the theory, as some do, that India-Pakistan relations live on borrowed time. I don't believe in that concept of borrowed time. I think we have to keep the lights on, as one of our famous poets, Sahir Ludhian, we said uh, some decades ago. We have to keep the lights on and work to disprove the prophecies that uh, you know we, li we are living on borrowed time, because we can have to continue to sweat uh, for peace and not bleed in war. Thank you. Um, uh, Akbar, did you want to, uh, we'd love to hear your perspective as well. Yes, uh, Michael, um, some really uh, complex and important and urgent issues have been raised, uh, starting with Kashmir. Now, again, uh, when I look at Kashmir, and I'm talking as uh, someone with a Pakistani background, but someone also equally with a South Asian background, I again feel really a sense of shame that these two countries, both nuclear, both with the aspirations to be modern states, uh, India sending probes to Mars and so on, they can't solve the problem of a, a region to which both of them, both of them have affection and respect. They say this is ours, the other one says this is ours. And in the, in the meantime, the people of Kashmir are going through, literally the, the expression was, this is paradise on earth. Today, it's hell on earth. If you look at what's happening there, and what shocks me is that no one seems to bother. No one is asking the Kashmiris, what do you want? Let us sit down, you, me, Indians, Pakistanis, and solve this problem. For 75 years, this is the 75th anniversary, nothing has happened to Kashmir. It just goes worse and worse and worse. So this is my first comment. And this, this reflects on the bigger question, which is the young generation, and where is it heading? Now, the young generation is doing very well, thank you. It's now abroad, they are in England, they're in America, they're making an impact. Very talented, very restless, brilliant youngsters. Uh, some of them, Ambassador Rao, had a dialogue with them across the border. They are making an impact and we are proud of them. But again, philosophically, ask yourself when there's so much hatred on a subcontinental level, which is building up this constantly, the media is pumping in this hatred, they create Muslim, 
with Pakistan, with all Muslims in the past, all Muslims are rapists, murderers, etc., which is absurd, but that is what's being pumped into the media, into the public, into the minds of millions and millions of people on both sides. So if any talk of nuclear weapons is being generated, which it is, then there's a counter movement on the other side. And I just, I am paralyzed with fear to think what would happen if there was a nuclear exchange? Because I don't think people have thought out what this will do to the people of South Asia. A bomb is not going to distinguish between Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs. It's going to kill everyone. And I ask myself, what would Mahatma Gandhi say to this? What would Kaide Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who is a man of great compassion and inclusivity, what would he say to this? The last thing they would say is we want weapons which would destroy these people who we love. These are our people. And yet, this is what is being contemplated unless, unless we come up with a solution and pull back. As Ambassador Rao has rightly said, that it's a very bleak picture right now. And it doesn't seem, and the worst part is, Michael, I must put this on record. The worst part is that the world seems to be completely exhausted. They don't want to know this problem, the South Asian problem. So you've got all the focus in the United States right now on the FBI raid on Maro Lago, Donald Trump's home in, in Florida. Or you've got the crisis in Ukraine, and no one is really bothered about South Asia. So I'm not saying that the United States can solve problems for us, but what I, what I want to hear is South Asian leaders seriously sitting down and sitting down with the will, with the resolution to start solving problems, if not for themselves, for the next and the next and the next generation. Because inevitably, I fear, and if you think about it, that is the logical conclusion, I fear that this train is heading for the precipice, and however cocky or confident the leaders may be on both sides of the border, that train is not going to just suddenly switch off and be stopped. The momentum will take it over, and that will be a complete nightmare, the, the nuclear holocaust. And that is where we're heading in the worst case scenario. The best case scenario, I would want the mutual, the legacy, the rich cultural legacy to be repeated, to be taught in each other's schools. I would want Indian schools to be teaching about the great Sufi saints of Pakistan, Bulle Shah, Bid Shah, uh, Mia Mir, Mia Mir, the great mystic saint who laid the foundation stone of the Sikh golden temple. Just think of this. Mia Mir's famous Muslim saint, he lays the foundation stone for the golden te temple of Amritsar. That is how close people were. That is the kind of relationship they had. That has been torn apart. And that needs to be, at least if not revived, at least we need to be aware of it. How many Indians even know? And I ask, I've got some wonderful uh, Indian students in my class, always very respectful, enthusiastic, always inquiring, wanting to build bridges. I ask them, do you know who wrote the national, one of the great national songs of India? Sare Jahan Se Acha Hindustan Hamara. Ambassador Rao, you know who that is. Yes, I do. Lama Iqbal. It's Lama Iqbal, the great Pakistani national poet. Pakistanis remember him and love him as the great nationalist poet, although he was um, Kashmiri by background, he wrote that poem. So you have this great interweaving of different cultures, which the current leaders of South Asia are busy putting up, pull, pulling apart. And India has that tradition. You've got great, great periods and narratives of coming together, building together, going right back to the great Ashoka King, Ashoka the Great, going back to Akbar the Great. And then you have um, uh, periods when people break apart these these uh, stitches. So a lot will depend on how the future leadership of South Asia conducts business for the next and the next generation. And I only hope that they have some idea of what they're destroying. Pakistan, which is being demonized all the time in, in the press, Pakistan has at its core some of the most fundamental features of Hinduism. Katras Raj, which is featured in the, in the uh, the, the holy text, Mahabharata, the Hindu holy text, it's in Pakistan. Taxila was one of the great universities for the Buddhists. The Sikh faith was born and grew up in Pakistan. The Indus Valley civilization is the very definition of Hinduism. Hinduism starts from that. Mohenjo-daro, Harappa is part of the culture of that land. You can't simply cut it away and say, you're the enemy, we're going to wipe you out. We'll nuke you and so you won't exist. What happens? to 220 million Pakistanis. They're not going to just disappear in a whiff of smoke. So I would say that both sides, especially the bigger side, that's India, needs to understand that when you're dealing with a smaller power, Pakistan is much, much smaller, India's 
over a billion people, Pakistan's about 220. I think they need to show more dignity, more respect. When you show respect, then people respect you back. And there are great traditions in, in South Asia of how people have treated each other with that dignity and respect. And they've moved this, this dialogue, this relationship forward. When it doesn't, then you have, of course, some uh, very dire results. And that has also happened in history. So we need to learn from our history. And we need to, the, the scholars and the teachers, teach this history both on this side of the border, that side of the border. I would like Pakistanis to learn about Mahatma Gandhi, about the great leaders in India, in Indian history. And the Indians need to learn a bit more about Muhammad Ali Jinnah and Qaeda Azam. Why did he leave the movement? Why did he lead the Pakistan movement? What made the champion, the ambassador of Hindu-Muslim unity, as he was called, by three presidents of the Indian National Congress? Why did he move from that position, completely the opposite end of the spectrum, and then lead a movement to Pakistan? We need to ask these questions seriously, not distort them, not make them a caricature, because now the uh, theory is that the Indians, uh, the English uh, hired him as an agent and he was an English agent. By the way, I've heard that about Gandhi also, that he was an English agent. So we need serious scholars asking these questions in the I, hope of enlightening us. I, you know, it's it's clear to anyone watching this program who the experts are and, and what my role is. You know, I'm, I'm the journalist here and I'm, I'm listening to the three of you. And I'm compelled to ask a follow up because uh, Ambassador Rao, you introduced the notion of Cold War jargon being the the coin of the realm in in this relationship. And Michael, then you re you use some of that. You talked about detente. And, and uh, Ambassador uh, Ahmed, you you have raised the nuclear specter, uh, another parallel with the Cold War, where we're talking about nuclear powers. And I just feel compelled from the lay position, Michael, to ask you a question about uh, how volatile or stable this relationship is in terms of those types of risks. How concerned should the countries, the region and the world be about that possibility? Thanks, John. You sell yourself short. I think you're more than a journalist, but I'm happy to uh, to weigh in uh, on this. And thank you again for those great uh, interventions by our two uh, speakers. No, I think we have reason to be concerned because what we've seen in recent years with uh, the India-Pakistan relationship is that uh, you know we know both countries have nuclear weapons, but we've seen a willingness to engage in uh, limited, but nonetheless, um, actual military uh, hostilities against each other, even under that nuclear umbrella. I mean, we saw back in 2019, it was just three years ago that, um, you know, after a terrorist attack, um, uh, India responded by launching a uh, airstrike went well across Pakistan. Um, and this was something that was very alarming for many because those types of things don't have have not happened really since both countries went nuclear in the late 1990s. And obviously, the more times or the more the, the more chance there is that the two countries could experience even limited conventional military hostilities under that nuclear umbrella, the chances of an escalation to the point where you have to worry about an actual nuclear war. Uh, you know, those the, the chances increase. So I don't want to be a scare. I don't want to be a fear monger. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, we're facing the inevitability of, of a conflict, another war between two nuclear armed countries. But I do think it's important to, um, to note that they have not been afraid to engage in military hostilities from time to time, not being deterred by the fact that both have nuclear weapons. And in that sense, it's, I guess you could argue it's a failure of nuclear deterrence in that sense. So yeah, I think there's reason to be concerned. I, I mean, as a South Asianist, I've often been one person that, that tells officials in Washington and beyond that, yeah, we need to pay more attention to what's going on in South Asia. I do think that with the uh, withdrawal of US forces from Afghanistan, you know, that lens, that sort of wider South Asia lens will be even more narrowly focused. And we have mm -hmm. seen uh, U.S. policy in South Asia really revolving around um, deepening relations with India. That certainly has been a major priority, which I can understand because you know, the core U.S. foreign policy uh, goal these days is to focus on the competition with, with China, and India is viewed in Washington as a key partner to enlist in that effort. Uh, and I do think that what we could see in the coming years is U.S. Uh, government views of, of South Asia being shaped by U.S.-China competition. Um, and that suggests a desire to work with India to try to counter Chinese um, influence in South Asia, which is very large. Uh, and that suggests that the India-Pakistan 
uh, issue will not necessarily get the, the fuller sort of laser focused attention that it may that it may deserve. So yeah, short answer to your question is I, I do think it is something to worry about, but I don't think that we should be fear mongers. Nothing is inevitable, but the fact that they're both nuclear countries and the fact that they're that they're neighbors and the fact that they fought multiple wars in the past and the fact that they've not been afraid to engage in, in skirmishes even with nuclear weapons, all those reasons suggest to me that we really should be a bit concerned. So we are getting tight on time, but we still still have some available. And Michael, I know that you had another question you wanted to pose. I just want to ask Nirampama and Akbar to be a little briefer in your answers for this round because we are getting tight on uh, on time. Yeah, thanks, John. And I'll, I'll be brief in posing the question as well. I think that both of you have mentioned the issue of leadership in South Asia and in, in India and Pakistan. And indeed, I think that one could argue that many in India have been willing to try to push closer to Pakistan because of concerns of the Pakistani army, which at the end of the day is the most powerful actor in Pakistan, has no interest in really welcoming better relations with India. Whereas in, in Pakistan, there's been reluctance to move closer to India because of concerns about the current government uh, in India, which of course is, is led by Narendra Modi, uh, who's up for re-election and there's a good chance that he'll win there's reason to think that his party will be around for some time. So given those realities, if we look back you know, in, in history, there have been some surprises when you have had some major breakthroughs uh, between the two sides. You know, there have been some unlikely figures like Pervez Musharraf, a military dictator who was right in the middle of a, uh, of a peace um, effort with India, which didn't succeed, but he was there. So I guess the question is, what type of leadership would be needed to put this relationship in a better place? And is it realistic? Is it at all realistic to think that that type of leadership could emerge anytime soon? Well, I, let me answer, attempt to answer that question. But before that, I'll just briefly dwell on the nuclear issue. Uh, and I think uh, as far as India is concerned, you know, there is a view in Pakistan that somehow India threatens the, the existence of Pakistan or the survival of Pakistan. And I don't think that is a rational view to take. I don't believe that India is a responsible country in global affairs and in the region has ever uh, directed its state policy towards Pakistan premised on that objective. So I'd like to make that point clear. The second point is that I think uh, the publics in both countries need to be educated more about the about the dangers and the and the destruction that a nuclear you know, war between the two could, could wreak on the population and indeed on the future of both countries. In that sense, constantly, I think, in the schools and especially with the young people, we need to instill that, that awareness. And I think that is a problem all across the world because we've had so many years of peace without the use of nuclear weapons that people have somehow grown complacent about it. And I think we need to be uh, absolutely sure about it. And I, talking about leadership, I think... Yes, there's no question that in the theoretical sense, you need bold and visionary leadership to solve problems of this nature between the two countries. I think uh, Prime Minister Modi started out essentially on the raw, on the right foot when he invited even the Pakistani Prime Minister to come to his swearing in when he became Prime Minister in 2014, made that unannounced visit to Pakistan uh, to drop in on, on Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif's family. I think there were a number of overtures that he made uh, in good faith uh, when he started out. And then you had uh, certain negative uh, repercussions in the sense that you had the terrorist attack on Pathan Court and followed by a series of other problems that, that uh, deepened the complexity and the complications in the relationship. So that's where the matter stands. I think Prime Minister Modi, with the kind of democratic mandate he has, is certainly well positioned to make those overtures towards Pakistan, but not in the current climate where the entire domestic uh, body politic is riled up about the fact of terrorism that emanates from Pakistan and to which our people have been victims. So that's really where the matter stands. And I believe that, uh, you know, if uh, with, with, I hope democratic politics in Pakistan can strengthen further and the and leaders will emerge that are able to take stock of the situation and understand that uh, the use of uh, 
terror instruments as a, as a, a method of policy directed against India will have to be given up, not only for the good of this relationship, but also for the good of Pakistan. And if and when that happens, I think the arena will be opened up for the resumption of dialogue, for at least, you know, for us to structure, perhaps not a golden tomorrow in this relationship, but at least a functional relationship where we trade with each other. Talking of Kashmir, people on both sides of the line of control, Kashmiris, deserve to be more in touch with each other. Families need to be reunited. We need to have transportation links. We need to have trade. We need to have pilgrimage routes opened up. And why shouldn't that happen? I think both our countries should be invested in the future of the Kashmiri people, in the good of the Kashmiri people, and which means uh, to be able to open up the atmosphere, open up the environment a little more, and uh, and forsake the vocabulary of confrontation, which has become just the just the uh, default in the relationship between the two. Ambassador Rao, I always say you're the best ambassador between India and Pakistan. I hope that doesn't get you a lot of flack from the trolls, but you really have that's the right approach to build bridges. Now, Michael, I want to make a comment. You raised some uh, very complicated and complex issues. You raised the issue of Pakistan, the army leadership, uh, the relationship with India. Very briefly, because John wants to wind this uh, discussion up, very briefly, Pakistanis, and I've talked to hundreds of Pakistanis, different uh, levels, uh, age groups, uh, different uh, social levels. Pakistanis want to get on with their lives, want to have a normal life. They are aware of the problems, the crises within the country. But looming over everything is the fact of India as a neighbor, a large neighbor. And Ambassador, please see it from the point of view of the other side. A huge neighbor, not two times bigger than, not three times, but 1.2 billion. It's massive. It's armies, so many million more men than Pakistanis. It's economy, everything, and constantly threatening nuclear. The ministers talking about using the nuclear strike, wiping out Pakistan from the face of the earth. If you read the truth, if you read and hear Amartya Sen, the Nobel Prize winner, Arundhati Roy, uh, Vice Chancellor Mehta, the, the Abdullah from Kashmir, Abdullah from Kashmir, who's such a pro Indian figure in Indian politics, the son of Sheikh Abdullah, he was crying on the Karam Thapar show. He said, where do we go? What happens to us Muslims in India? We can't go to China. We go, can't go to Pakistan. We are not being left alive. So that is a threat that Pakistanis feel. So they feel that Mr. Jinnah gave us this nation. And if this was destroyed, our position, our life, and our status would be that of the Muslims of India. And this is how they're being treated. Now, that is what drives them into supporting democracy. Pakistanis are very committed to the idea of democracy. But when the army comes in, I've seen that even the most democratic Pakistani will say that is what is shielding us from India. So there's your relationship. As long as there's a threat from India, the Pakistanis will support the army and see that as the one barrier that's stopping the Indians. And they'll give it any support to ensure that they are safe. So again, this uh, relationship, I would say, goes back to Jinnah's decision, I'd raised this question, why did Jinnah shift his position from ambassador of Hindu Muslim unity to the champion of Pakistan? Because he constantly said, I want guarantees for the safety of my community. If you cannot keep them safe, then we are splitting. We cannot live being threatened like this. And we, and there's a whole report on this, the Pirpu report of 1938, and there's a lot of literature on this. So we need to raise these deep questions if we are to move as Indians and Pakistanis to move ahead seriously, not through distortions, because even a man like Jinnah, in the Indian media, he's either distorted or he's dropped. You don't hear of him. So here's one of the major figures of Indian society, Indian history, and you know very little about him. He's just a caricature. Very little. I read uh, the Indian press. And the few Indians, like uh, Mr. Adwani, Mr. Vajpai, uh, Singh, uh, the, the uh, Indian BJP, just one Singh, these are very distinguished senior figures. They actually wrote about Jinnah with great respect and their own party got after them and they were penalized just for uh, admiring Mr. Jinnah. This has to change because we need to respect each other. We need to know each other, to understand each other with empathy, with some sophisticated understanding of the other side if we are to really move ahead. And I'm talking as a teacher, as te a teacher who 
deals with students whose job it is to teach and disseminate knowledge. Uh, and I've been doing this all the time and I get very positive results. I have some Pakistani students, Indian students appreciating each other's point of view. So we are past the time that we had originally had planned, and I appreciate Akbar you acknowledging my unenviable role as timekeeper. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's uh, listen with resources like the three of you, we could go on forever, and this has been a terrific discussion. I, I want to close now, but leave our viewers and listeners with one final parting gift from each of you, and and that's the you know the complexity we talked about, the history we talked about the lack of understanding in the U.S. compared to other parts of the world on things like partition. I'm going to ask each of you, is there a book, a movie, a TV show? Because we don't have to do all academics here because there is power in popular culture in, in teaching us about history and events. Could each of you give our viewers and listeners one recommendation for those who want to continue to explore these topics and, or an aspect of these topics and maybe dive even deeper than we did today. Um, uh, Akbar, I'll start with you, then Ambassador Rao, and then Michael. One recommendation. John, my recommendation is the book I wrote as part of the Jinnah Quartet in trying to answer this question for myself and for Pakistanis and for Indians, hopefully. The book is called Jinnah, Pakistan, and Islamic Identity, The Search okay. for Saladin. Thank you. Ambassador Rao. Well, I, my, you talked about movies, and my favorite movie, it's a Hindi movie, it's called Garam Hava, which essentially translates very literally into warm air. But it's a story of the impact of partition on a Muslim family living in the city of Agra, the, the city where the Taj Mahal is located. Uh, it's a beautiful movie. It was made about almost 50 years ago, but I think it's a classic, and I would invite you to watch it. Thanks. Great movie, great movie. Michael. Yeah, luckily there have been some really great books written on the India-Pakistan relationship recently. Um, and one that really gets into the how the partition has impacted it uh, is a book called Midnight's Furies, so the deadly legacy of India's partition by uh, Nasid Hajari, who's an American um, uh, journalist, has worked with Bloomberg. A great reader, and especially for a general audience that really may not have much of an understanding about, about partition and, how, and what it meant. So that, that would be my recommendation. That would be one of my recommendations. Well, th thanks to all three of you, really. This has been a privilege. And uh, uh, it's like going to college. It's like being in your uh, one of your classes, Akbar. Uh, thanks to all three of you. And to our viewers and listeners, we certainly hope you enjoyed this special edition of Wilson Center Now in partnership with the Asia Program. And if you'd like to learn more, come to wilsoncenter.org and the Asia program has a great resource for the types of topics and others we've been talking about today. Also with links to the work of Nirupama Rao and Akbar Ahmed, two global fellows with that program. Thanks again for joining us. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you again soon. Until then, for everyone at the Thank center you. and the Thank Asia you. program, Thank I'm John Molesky. Thanks for watching. Thanks.